So, have you thought about uh, what we need to get this job done? Well, the first thing you may think about is um, what is different here? When we have a cache miss, we have to go on the bus and see if someone else has the data, maybe modified state. And then in that case, we need to get the data from them. Or the other way around, if I want to write a cache line, I need to get rid of their data. So I need to be able to see into another cache someone else's cache and this is the snooping capability that we we, we were referring to when uh, describing this type of implementation the snoop based coherence so how do you know if a cache has uh, a particular data or not well when the processor was asked uh, was accessing it you check the tag but now this is different this is not uh, a particular processor checking its own cache to see if it has a particular line but someone else maybe from the bus checking from the other side and that's actually uh, a problem <clears throat> and that reminds you of something that you perhaps still remember in um, basic uh, out of order microprocessor or maybe not even uh, out of order microprocessor, but uh, superscalar microprocessor. You have two users or multiple users trying to get the same resource. What is the problem? Structural conflict, potential structural conflict. Okay. Uh, one of the ways to solve, to avoid structural conflict is to duplicate your resource. So here is the issue about getting the tag. The processor wants to access it. And the bus also wants to access it. Okay, um, <clears throat> we know that memory access is very important. Uh, L1 cache access is so important. In fact, they do a lot of optimizations around this memory access in, in IBM uh, power processors, for example. Sometimes the whole, uh, the, the whole L1 access takes two and a half cycle you know, with the uh, half a cycle. So they start the access early uh, so as to squeeze everything in. So we don't want to delay this. We don't want to have the processor to wait because of structural conflict. So maybe we will need dual tag. And then you may, you may ask, um, what about dual port? Okay, so that's another opportunity. That's another possibility. But when you have port, it's generally more expensive in terms of energy per access. If I have two tags, each tag is just one X, uh, whatever the, the energy consumption when you're accessing it. If you have a dual ported tag, every access itself, no matter from which port, gets slightly more expensive. So that might be one of the considerations. Why dual port is used very common. Actually, come to think of it, does that solve all your structural conflict problem? Now that you have dual tags, actually no, <clears throat> because when you want to change the tag, okay, either from the processor side or from the bus side, you need to write to the tag set it to be invalid, to set it to be modified. What do you do? What do you, what do, you do? You have to grab both tags. You have to be able to, to change both of them. Otherwise, they get incoherent with respect to each other. So what's the implication? You can't get rid of structural conflict completely. You can try to minimize it, but you can't get rid of it completely. OK. No big deal, right? Well, actually, there is a slightly uh, important part of this big deal, uh, which we'll come back slightly later. This, the implication is that we cannot guarantee to be able to perform um, a snooping whenever we want. We may have to delay it. Okay, okay it's not a long delay, but this uh, changes how things are done. We'll get back to that. 
So now let's think about this. What do we do? And let's go back to the uniprocessor, or what I should say, uh, call the canonical uniprocessor. It doesn't really exist. We, we don't have uniprocessor. There's always another bus master uh, in any machine that is uh, reasonably sophisticated for real world use. There's a DMA, IO device, whatever. But let's pretend that we have a canonical uniprocessor where there is a core issuing commands and there is a cache controller. So what do we do? We break down the address into index, tag, uh, offset, all of that, right? And then we find out we don't have the data in a cache. So that's a miss. What do we do? Well, let's pretend we have a bus-based system. doesn't have to be bus, but let's say we do, and then we need to go to the bus. So you request. You send an arbiter signal to say, I need the bus. When you get the bus grant, you start to um, drive the data and the command line to say, oh, well, this is a read or this is a write, and wait for the other side of uh, the device to reply. It may be the next level cache, it may be memory. That's what uh, that's what happens in the uniprocessor. Then your data gets transferred, right? So now what happens is we have a snoop based multiprocessor. So the other who's on the bus is the other processors. See? Can you imagine what happens? When I'm reading, what happens? Well, when I'm reading, data may be dirty in another cache. And I need to know that. From this cache controller's perspective, I need a line to tell me this happens, that happens. Right? We need to know whether it's dirty in another cache or not. If we don't, how do we know where the data is coming from? Okay? Because if it's dirty in another cache, we need a cache-to-cache -cache transfer from that, from this uh, owner of the dirty data. And perhaps we have to shut down the memory unit to say, well, please don't. No need to um, to get the data from you. It's out of date. Conversely, if I'm writing, it's a miss. I'm writing. What do I have to do? I have to invalidate other um, caches, right? Um, and this is when I'm generating a request. So the cache controller on uh, a processor needs to do these two things to be able to initiate cache-to-cache uh, -cache transfer or to, to receive data from another cache and to be able to invalidate someone else's data. Conversely, if you are on the receiving side, you're sitting on the bus, you're not issuing a request, someone may poke, may poke you and say, hey, invalidate your cache. So you need to invalidate your own cache line. So how is this really done? We'll show you an example. Um, it doesn't have to be done this way, but there's a signal, and we'll see how uh, one way of generating this signal uh, is, and how do you generate it, and when. Let's get to the when uh, part first, okay? And this ties back to the structural conflict of the tag. So, if someone sends you uh, a snooping request to say, hey, do you have this cache line, right? And that's the snooping request. What is it really? It's there's address on the bus and a request to say, can you check your own tag to see if you have that in your, in your tag? It's not a binary decision. It's not a binary response. Yes, no. In fact, there are three possibilities, okay? Yes, no. I don't know at the moment. Why? Because I have a structural conflict. I can't tell you now. Okay, so that's actually important. Instead of um, being given the command and after a fixed amount of time, I will tell you yes, no, the answer may be uh, I don't know. And this is why if someone invites you to a party and it sends uh, RSVP, which is really uh, short from French, respondez s'il vous plaît please respond, you shouldn't uh, ignore it. You shouldn't say, well, you know, um, I'm going. So it's, it's not a no, I don't have to tell the host. Well, you, you do because 
when the, when the host is issuing our RSVP to you, he or she doesn't even know uh, you got it or not. So the initial assumption is you haven't read it until they hear a yes or no from you. So what does that mean? What, wh why does that matter? Suppose we make a design that uses a fixed number of clock cycles. Okay, we have a design. How do we snoop? We put the address uh, on the bus for five cycles and everybody checks their own tag. Okay, this, you have to be conservative because because of structural conflict, you might not be able to do that in five cycles. So maybe you set it to uh, whatever length that is most likely to happen in the longer time. And even then, you may have to have some um, some way to, uh, to to indicate that, well, I need more time. Okay, Maybe you give uh, priority to your processor. That's the general assumption, processor uh, read, you want that to have priority, so the snoop may not be able to accomplish what it, uh, uh, what you're asking it to do, which is uh, checking usually it's possible, uh, but if, uh, if the processor is on the other hand taking both, uh, both tags, you may have problem. So this is why some machines have variable delay, <coughs> which is this, there is another line um, that everybody shares uh, to use to indicate that I need more time. So your answer can indeed be yes, I have it, no, I don't have it, and no, I don't know yet. Okay, So there, this problem, the problem is fundamental that no matter what, we might have a structural conflict, so the timing on when we get the result is not guaranteed to be always just like checking a cache, I mean, in, in your uh, data cache, uh, the, the situation is simpler. You assume after a fixed number of cycles, let's say two cycle delay, you either know you have the data hit or you don't have the data, which is a miss. And now this is different from that. After a fixed amount of cycles, you may not know uh, what the snoop result is. So let's see how uh, this is done one way. And this is a, a, a typical implementation that is using what is called a wired uh, or or wired and logic. Okay, so you see this a lot. Uh, usually, we use a um, uh, MOS gate to charge a line. It's a form of dynamic logic. So you pre-charge the line uh, to high, and then anybody who find the data in modified state. <coughs> uh, I think this is uh, Intel's uh, convention of labeling their pin called hit M. So this hit M signal would be asserted and usually it's negative logic so uh, when it's low it means it's a hit M and then in that case we uh, will turn this on so <coughs> The, uh, the, the uh, logic would be uh, inverted, so if you do have hit M, you assert it to be zero, and then uh, because that's what the pin is driving, it's driving zero, and uh, with this uh, inverter here, uh, the MOS gate is turned on, and we discharge. So. If this line is charged to one, what this says is, okay, this is assuming there is no hit M anywhere. But if any cache on the bus has the data in modified state, what does that mean? That means that cache will intervene. Okay, we're doing a read. If nobody responds, we just go to the memory. So we pre-charge the line to one. If after a certain amount of cycle, it's still one, then we know nobody has it, and we proceed to get the data from, from memory. But if someone has it in modified state, that someone will drain the line to zero, and we will know. 
we will know someone will be putting the data on the bus. We will not need the data from the next level, say memory. Okay, so this is really an, an or logic. Anybody who has it, uh, if, if you have a hit M or he has a hit M, anybody who has the data in modified state, we will intervene, the system will go into intervene mode. Okay? A wired uh, logic is just a very fast way, usually a dynamic logic, very fast way of getting this done. Okay, so uh, the same, uh, and, and, and at that point, cache to cache data transfer happens. Okay? Um, in a similar way, you can have a wire that tells you about whether some cache has data in shared state or hit S, okay? And why is that useful? Well, it's useful because if hit S, um, if we know whether someone else has the data in shared state, then we can infer whether we should go into shared state or we should go into exclusive state. That's one uh, optimization. Nobody has it, we're exclusive, and the data, remember the messy protocol, we will go into exclusive state. Um, another thing is, suppose someone has the data in their cache, okay? Then we can still do a cache-to-cache -cache transfer of the shared data. We're intervening in this case, not because we have to, because like in the uh, case someone has a modified data, if we don't intervene, um, we'll be loading stale data. If we don't have modified data, we have shared data, we can still provide cache-to-cache -cache transfer because it might be faster than loading data from memory. <clears throat> but there is a problem. Suppose uh, this processor has data in shared state, this processor has data in shared state, and I am issuing a read request. And I realize, all right, uh, I did a poll to say, is there a hit S? And the answer is yes, there is a hit S. So what is the difference here? The difference between hit S and hit M is that in the latter case, we know there is only one guy in modified state. But it, if uh, we have a hit S signal, we only know that there are other sharers, uh, one or more. And who's going to drive the bus? You can't allow two nodes to drive the bus. At the same time, you can get into a short circuit situation and damage the processor, so that's not allowed. This is why sometimes you see a MOSI style protocol where there is an owned state. One of the benefits of this extra state is to have, uh, is to reduce, it's to get rid of ambiguity about who is going to supply data. It's the guy in own state. So if you're in S state, shut up, it's not your business. Um, someone else will take care of it. But if you're in O state, you know you're unique. You're the owner, you supply data. One of the use, okay? Uh, but it, it's a design choice. You don't have to because this whole thing is optimization, cash to cash transfer. It's not necessary. Uh, it's useful for performance. So now we have to consider write back. Remember, we have write back cache, which is commonly used. Um, and that adds complexity. And as you will see, this repeats uh, for every little complexity that we add. Everything, every feature we have for the cache adds complexity to the coherence protocol, which is why this is a very messy subject. So what is a write back cache? Well, we um, we have, we have a, a not, not, not a write through cache. Anytime you write, you write to the cache. It's uh, into the cache. The cache is dirty, different from the memory. Um, you're only writing the entire cache line back when it becomes evicted. And in those cases, you generally want to put the write back somewhere uh, in the background in a buffer to allow uh, reads to go through. Uh, and if that happens, 
you have this separate buffer to hold the, the dirty lines, that's still part of your cache. Yeah, you haven't written it back. It's just a different location to store the data. So that that's partly your new your cache content. And when you snoop, you have to snoop the right buffer as well. Okay. So let's see what happens. Now it will look like this. And trust me, we're far from done. So we have our data. This is where we store the real data. We have our dual tag, the maybe the processor's side tag over here, the bus side tag on the left. And we have a write back cache with a write back buffer. And that sits in the middle. Okay. So if we evict the cache line that's dirty, we have to put it into this buffer. And if you, uh, the controller is over here, when the processor issues a request, the address is going to be processed and then sent to the processor tag, processor side tag to check the state to see if you have a hit and so on. And if it's a miss, we have to go to the bus, send our command, maybe pass down the address to say, oh, I want to read address X. And then uh, when we do get the, the bus and the, the uh, memory unit uh, response, the data comes in and we load it into the, the cache data RAM. So this is your uh, original processor side. And now we have to have the bus side. If there is a transaction on the bus that says, uh, I'm reading from location X, um, please tell me if you have the data. We will source the data rather than driving the bus. We will source the data or the, the, what is the what is being uh, presented on the bus and it's the address, right? Another processor reads cache line X. We take X in and we start to use that to check. Do we have cache line X? Okay, and taking into account what is the request, the command over here, right? If it's a read, we just check to see if we have it. If it's write, we have to turn it, we have to invalidate it. And so the bus side controller is doing all of that and the answer is going back uh, into the snoop state to, um, to let the whole system know. And because your write back buffer is part of the cache, it's uh, not a regular, in, not in the regular array, but it's still there. So the comparator has to be there for both the tag, for both the uh, uh, tag for the regular cache array and for whatever is in your write back buffer. Okay, so this is how it works. You have um, these components working together to search, to, uh, to, to snoop. Now, because of this write back and this potentially uh, and, and the um, potential of putting uh, cache line into your write back buffer, you are going to have uh, multi step transactions. And this involves the notion of transient state. It's no longer a one shop, one step deal. But why? Let's think about an example and this is processor A oh I want to write to cache line X right now I have X in my cache but it's in shared mode well normally this is very simple right I grab the bus and I want to upgrade okay we call that upgrade so if you remember we have the um, <clears throat> Initially, we have the MESI, MESI, those states, okay? So if we want to write, we will go from shared state to memory state, uh, to modified state, okay? So that's ultimately where we want to be. But what actually happens is we have to invalidate everybody else, and then we can be in the modified state. Um, in that case, we call that an upgrade because now our permission or privilege of that cache line gets increased. We can read and write, not just read. Okay. 
So this is what we want to do. But recall, this is what we want to do. We haven't done that yet. So what if before we uh, obtain the bus, someone else got to the bus first and someone else wants to write to that same location? And that becomes an invalidation to us. And we have to take, we have to take that. So now we're no longer in the shared mode, nor in what we desire to be the modified node. In fact, we have to go to a lower state, the invalid mode. Okay? So we have to go to the invalid mode first, but then later on when we do get the bus, we have to go from invalid mode eventually to modified mode, because that's what we want. We want to write to that line, except in the case of from shared mode to, mod to modified mode, we just need to invalidate everybody else. We don't need a cache line. We have it. It's good. It's clean. It's useful. But when we get demoted to the invalid mode, now we don't even have the data. And to be able to go to the modified state, we first have to get the data from someone else. So we're changing. This is why if you express uh, the uh, the state transition it's no longer simple from S to go to M so this is what you will see sometimes referred to as a, uh, a transient state transition diagram we are initially in shared mode and we want to go to modified mode so what do we do we enter into the transient mode this is just one processor. We're not worried about anything else. So we're now in the mode, you can call it S trying to get M, or S to M, shared mode trying to get to modified mode. And we need to wait. If we do get the bus grant, okay, we get the bus, fine. Now what do we do? This is our action, the action is bus upgrade, which means, again, we invalidate everybody else, and then we upgrade our copy. Boom. We go to the stable state of M. But what if during this period we get an invalidation to that cache line? Okay, if it's to a different line, it doesn't matter. We can still stay in this, in this state. But this line happens to be what we want. Now we're going to this intermediate state. Okay? It's a bus read X. What that means is read exclusive. Okay? What's a read exclusive? It's a read plus um, uh, an, a desire to get into exclusive state. Okay? So that's invalidating us. <coughs> so our, our uh, so in this diagram, the, I forgot to say, the pair that you have over here on the left-hand side is uh, what happens on the right-hand side is the action. So, so slash, after the slash, this is what happens. So here you have, uh, what happens is you get a bus grant, and then the next thing you do is an upgrade. Here, what happens is a bus read, and what happens, uh, what you do next is a flush. Once you flush the line, you go into this state. It's invalid, but you don't go all the way to invalid state. No, because you know you want to go to modified state eventually, right? So because of that, we don't have this. We are trying to get to M state. So we have to stay in this, uh, we have to stay in this We have to stay in this uh, invalid, waiting to be modified state. And then when we get the bus grant, we proceed to do our read exclusive. And eventually, when that's finished, we get into the modified state. Okay, so if you have a cache line that is a miss, you read, it's a miss. So when that happens, you're, you're initially the cache line is essentially in, in valid state. 
it's not even in your cache, uh, or it's in the cache, but the state is invalid, it's all the same, it's a cache miss, then you will go, and when the processor issues a read, uh, you will go to the state of I, trying to go to S or E state. You wait there. When you get the bus grant, okay, you proceed to issue a bus read. And if S, and if as you're reading, you uh, send out the request to, to, to ask, do you have the, the same cache line? And the answer is yes, you come to the shared state. If the answer is no, nobody has the same line, which is what I'm trying to show here. I don't know why it, it says it's, if it's as bar, it's not shared. So we get the bus grant and we did a bus read and we find out nobody shares the line. So then we will go into the exclusive state. Okay, so now we have a couple of <clears throat> these state that are transient, meaning uh, now there is a bus involved. When we want to do something, we may not get it. We have to wait uh, to represent that. We have transient state, and these are the transient state that uh, we can use a different color, maybe um, blue, a green. So we have the normal state, and we have these one, two, three transient states. Okay. So before you think, oh, now, great, we need uh, three bits to encode all this. Um, the thing is, usually we don't have that many lines that are being handled in, in transient mode. So we don't encode them in the cache. The cache is really just encoding the stable states. In this case, uh, still MESI, the, um, um, let's use, red okay so these are your stable states right that's what you encode in your cache uh, only the several cache lines that are your you're handling at the time you put them in special buffers do you encode the transient states okay so uh, now you have transient state okay so the actual number of state is higher is usually far higher than the number of uh, stable state that we, we use to describe a protocol, messy and so on. We will see uh, a graph when we're all done with all this. So now we're gradually unpeeling this onion. You know, there's transient state. It's more complex than, uh, than just stable state. The next bunch of things that we want to discuss has to do with timing, okay? You have to uh, remember that we discuss all these consistency models, so the timing of them matters, so the coherence uh, circuit needs to take that into account um, to know how transactions are serialized, what happens before what, um, and what's allowed, uh, what is an allowed order and what is not, and that's serialization, which we will discuss next.